Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Pat said, we're, we're going to move fairly quickly. I've got a reasonable amount of content to get through here. And what I really want to make sure I do is allow enough time for Thibault uh, to do a demo today and really kind of pull some of the concepts that we're going to be talking about together. Uh, and I also want to make sure that we're allowing enough time for questions at the end. So I will move very quickly. But what I wanted to start with was really just a, a bit of a setup. Uh, and talk about uh, where we've been for the last 20 years. I actually implemented my first uh, imaging system back in 1995 for a major nonprofit in Los Angeles. So I started out actually on the customer side before moving over onto the vendor side and have been working with these technologies now in my career for almost 25 years. Um, what's been really, really interesting for me, and particularly looking uh, across my experience at different vendors, is as we look at content, as we look at content management, uh, and the role that content has played in organizations like yours, so much hasn't changed. We recently conducted a poll with UK financial services companies, and I thought this was really illustrative in terms of the continuing challenge that we see with content, but also illustrative of the opportunity that we see with artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if we talk about enterprise content management as a concept that's been around for 20 plus years now, and we talk about how organizations work with information, uh, we still see some of the same challenges that we saw 20 years ago. Number one, many of the organizations responded, in fact, eight out of 10 uh, responded that their systems aren't fully connected to one another. So they have information in their organization, but that information is trapped in silos. As a matter of fact, the average number of systems that they have in place for managing content in their organizations across our respondents was nine. So literally nine different information silos inside the organization. The impact of that is very simply that it's hard to find information. In fact, average time spent looking for information is 52 minutes. So literally one hour out of every day or about 15% of productivity impacted by that effort to find information. Now, what else was interesting in this survey was that of the people that we surveyed, 60% saw the potential of AI to automate mundane tasks to begin to help with this challenge, but also that same percentage saw that their organization may lack critical skills in order to capitalize on artificial intelligence and the impact that this technology can have in their organization. So if we think back to 20 years ago, we see these same challenges continuing over and over again. And our argument for today and what we really wanted to share with you is that we believe it is time for a new approach here. We believe that technologies like machine learning enable a new approach here and that they can have a significant impact on some of these traditional challenges that we've seen in insurance and financial services organizations. So in order to kind of set up our discussion today, and I am going to focus most of my comments today on machine learning, but I'm also gonna to touch on a couple other areas of modern content management and some challenges that we're seeing in other insurance companies. Um, I wanted to quickly kind of go through what we see as priorities for modern insurers. And I'm sure for many of you, this is motherhood and apple pie, but I thought I'd at least kind of set it against the backdrop of what are our customers trying to accomplish. First and foremost, we typically talk about efficiency and automation in terms of managing information, right? Work more efficiently, take cost out of the organization, enable automation wherever we can, and of course, drive better, faster decisions uh, for the organization. Other priorities include things like customer experience. And when we talk to customers about content, one of the things that we typically find is content plays a critical, critical role in their customer experience. How do we expose information to customers? How do we enable them to self-service? How do we use content effectively to improve that overall customer experience? Almost all of our customers, in fact, all of our customers today, are really talking about cloud and how they can better adopt cloud in their environment, how they can begin to move critical information and content into lower cost cloud infrastructure tiers. So this is a critical trend that we also see amongst our insurance customers. And it's really a conversation of whether it's a vendor managed cloud 
or whether it's a self-managed cloud for the organization. On-premise, we see fewer and fewer organizations demanding on-premise deployments of our technology. And really what we're focused on there is how do we enable them to have choice? And then finally, compliance is a topic not going away. We continue to see it in financial services. We have some new compliance drivers that are making it more important, and particularly when we talk about in Europe, GDP, GDPR, or in the U.S., CCPA, uh, where we really need to have granular access to customer information. We need to have control over that information. And in particular, this is where we see challenges with silos in organization and the need to bridge across those different silos. So there's the setup. Now, let's talk specifically about efficiency and automation, and in particular, how artificial intelligence and machine learning can help bring more efficiency, more automation, and begin to address some of these content challenges that we talked about. Uh, the first thing I'd like to focus on when we talk about content, when we talk about information, is the role of data and content and information. Now, most people think when they see this slide, information equals data plus content, but I'm talking about structured and unstructured information. No, what I'm really talking about here is the role that data plays in making content into information, into accessible information for the organization. We believe strongly at Nuxio that data plays a critical role in how organizations work with content, and this is one of the key opportunities that we see around machine learning and automation and artificial intelligence is to enrich the data that we have about content. The simple fact is that data is what makes content findable. It's what makes content readily accessible. It's also what makes content contextual. And in this case, when we say contextual, what we usually mean is it really gives us the ability to deliver information in the context of work that your organization is performing. So whether it's policy issuance, underwriting, customer onboarding, this is how we leverage data to deliver critical content in the right context for knowledge workers to perform work. Of course, we also want to make sure that content is available anywhere. And as we start to look across different devices, different delivery mechanisms, data becomes very important in helping us to intelligently deliver information when, where, and how it is needed. And of course, data is also what enables us to ensure that information in your environment is properly governed, secure, and that we have appropriate privacy where we need to have privacy in the organization. So the bottom line is that data plays a critical role in terms of how we manage content. Now, the other thing that we like to think about when we start talking about machine learning and AI is what different business problems does it solve? So we talked about data, and the first and key business problem here really is around how we extract data from existing content, so kind of tick that box. But the other things and more advanced use cases, edge use cases that we wanted to share today had to do with how we begin to leverage AI and machine learning to automate critical processes, critical interactions with content. And on the third piece, really how we're leveraging AI and machine learning to enable new levels of insight inside of your organization. So I'll give you some examples of all three of these. Let's begin with data extraction and entity extraction. Uh, what we typically see in a lot of early use cases that we've seen here had to do with different public cloud services, uh, machine learning services that are offered by some of your leading cloud vendors. So whether it's Google, Amazon, Microsoft, or even specialty vendors like Site Engine, a lot of these offer pre-trained machine learning models to perform different actions on content. And they're very, very document-centric technologies. And as I've kind of illustrated here, typically what you're doing as a user is you're handing a piece of content, a document, or even an image off to a cloud service, and that cloud service returns data to you. Now, these are pre-trained models that are designed to do certain things. So. These are commodity services, like if I want to OCR or ICR, so how do I do handwriting recognition or text-based recognition in a document? They can also perform sentiment analysis to tell me perhaps if I'm dealing with a customer service interaction and an email or a text or some other message from a customer, are they happy or are they unhappy? We can perform translation, transcription, so we can take video or audio content and translate that 
uh, from speech into text-based uh, analysis. We can even stack these together. So perhaps I might have a call interaction, an audio interaction, perform speech text transcription, and then apply sediment analysis on top of it. We can also, when we're looking at images, pictures, photos, video, we can do facial celebrity recognition, other things like this. So as I said, these services are public cloud service, pre-trained machine learning models. Uh, we find them across Google, Amazon, Microsoft, lots of different services to help us enrich content, extract information for content. And typically here, what I would say is you're looking for a standardized approach as you're working with more modern content platforms to plug into these different services and to leverage these capabilities where you need them. The only caution I typically give to customers here is beware of the law of large numbers. Typically when you look at pricing here, it's a very, very small click charge per transaction when you hand uh, object of content off to a service to get data back. But for some of our customers who are dealing with hundreds of millions, even billions of objects in their environment, that charge can add up very, very quickly. The other thing that we like to talk about when we talk about generic services, commodity services like this, is they're great for certain use cases, but generic services typically produce generic data. Now, for this illustration, I, I pulled a picture of an automobile accident. And what I did here actually with this image, and this is a great example of a use case that we see with our customers in terms of processing accident photos as part of a modern claims process. What I've done here is actually loaded this image into the Google Cloud Vision API service. Now, Cloud Vision is an image recognition service, and what it does is return data values. And you can see on the right the data values that we got from this service. Now, it's done a good job of recognizing that the vehicle on the left is a sport utility vehicle. It's also done a good job of recognizing that it's a Chevy Tahoe in this image. But as you can see, a lot of the other data values are either not very specific or aren't very helpful in terms of processing this, processing this as a claim. What we like about this is it really illustrates the power of machine learning AI to pull data, even out of an image in this case that has no text associated with it. But what we really want, and this is where we begin to see real value from a machine learning standpoint, is to begin leveraging custom models. So one of the things that we've looked at and we actually enable in the Nuxio platform is for customers to take their own content and their own data to train custom machine learning models. And one of the benefits of a custom machine learning model is you can train it to produce much more specific data values that are perhaps much more valuable to your business. So in this example, what I've done is looked at the same photo and kind of illustrated the kind of values that you can extract with a custom machine learning model. So I can identify the brand, I can identify the model, I can identify the vehicle color, and perhaps even here what I want to do is identify the fact that it is an Illinois license plate, I can identify the license number, I can identify that the other vehicle also has an Illinois license plate with a partial license number available. And yes, we can leverage these technologies to begin to extract critical data like this out of the image. Now one of the things that might not be as apparent in this image, and I really kind of pulled this out as an illustration, but is that there is also a vehicle operator that is present in this photo. And perhaps if I had the proper training, I could even leverage this information to compare to identification information to identify who the vehicle operator in the picture is as well. So custom models produce much more accurate information in this circumstance. Now, one of the real values that we see and when we start talking about data extraction, we talked earlier about that challenge of multiple silos inside the organization, is that data allows us to begin bridging across these different silos. The challenge we see is that in many cases, as you look at different systems, they have different sets of data, different metadata models. But one of the real values that we see with AI and this ability to do data enrichment and data extraction is we can begin to normalize those data models, build a master metadata model across different silos that now makes this information more uniformly findable. When we talked about that CCPA use case earlier where I need to access customer information from different systems, this becomes very, very important. 
In a recent conference I was at, I was talking to an insurance customer, and they literally shared with me that they had people on staff whose job it was to have logins to all their different systems so that they could go through system by system and search for customer information in response to customer privacy data requests. Not a very efficient way to do it. This is one of the examples where we see power in terms of being able to do, use AI to extract data, enrich these metadata models, and get greater consistency across them. Other opportunities that we see with AI, and now let's talk a little bit about automation. Very, very common use case for our insurance customers here. I just kind of illustrated here. This is a forms processing use case, right? And particularly here for this customer, it was all about policy uh, and, and uh, issuance and new business underwriting, right? So the first thing, and what was fascinating to me, is 60% of their information still comes in in handwritten form. So the first thing they wanted to do was to be able to validate that the form was properly completed. So very simple use case, customer submits a form, in this case probably a handwritten form. The first thing we want to do is an image recognition activity, identify what form it is, and then two, determine whether or not the form has been completed correctly. Does it have signatures in the right place? Does it have the right data in the right field? We can do that with machine learning and custom machine learning models. If the answer to that question is no, we can kick off an intelligent exception handling process and route that form back to a customer to be properly completed before we ever try to process it. Or if we determine the form has been correctly completed, we know what form it is, now we want to perform form processing, extract data from that form, the entity extraction piece, and then intelligently route that form, the corresponding data, to a work performer who's actually then going to be able to move that underwriting process uh, forward to the next step. So a good example of how we can apply machine learning to do data value, about, uh, validation to validate these forms, to kind of automate this process and not have that typical manual dependency on processing. Now, a lot of circumstances, I get questions here in terms of, hey, I've been doing form processing for a long time. And what we hear from our customers is a lot of this information now doesn't come into the mailroom. It comes in through other sources electronically. And it's very difficult with traditional mailroom, scan capture, uh, form processing technology to really stand up a separate process to deal with the forms that are coming in through other vehicles, through other electronic distribution channels. So what they really want to do is use machine learning to set up an enterprise service to process these forms regardless of how they receive them from customers, whether it's an email, whether they're electronic submissions, mobile submissions to their site. Now, the other use case here, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's a great example of insight, and I'm going to let Thibaut demo it for you in a few moments, is really around bringing more insight into your business. And this is a real edge use case that we're seeing with some of our property and casualty insurance customers. So I will illustrate the process here, and then Thibaut will give you an actual demo of it. But in this circumstance, what we have is a customer who submits images of an accident photo uh, as part of the claims process. Now, the first thing we want to do from a fraud detection standpoint is determine, hey, has it been used in some other claim? So we perform some simple image processing. We're able to identify if a duplicate photo or a similar photo has been submitted somewhere else. We then can pass that to someone who can make a determination if, in fact, yes, it is, in fact, a duplicate photo, and then route that into the appropriate process from a fraud standpoint. It's not a duplicate photo. The second thing they wanted to be able to do in this circumstance, this is really where we begin to see uh, content lakes and where organizations are beginning to build large sets of information that they can then get insight from. So what we're going to do is take that accident photo, we're going to compare it to a large set of photos and damage estimate information that we have, identify similar make, model, damage, you know, perhaps in the front fender, uh, and as a result, be able to begin to automatically and instantaneously derive damage estimates, which we then can use as the baseline of information. So I could just take this accident claim, I now have a range of damage estimates, push it out to my repair network, and allow them to submit estimates against 
this range that I have already intelligently derived and then utilize that to either intelligently then route those estimates with my data information here to a work processor or even make a decision and say, hey, these three estimates are in the correct range, so therefore I can automatically approve them. The point is what I'm able to do is begin to build reference information in my organization, a combination of images and data, content and data, that allow me then to perform comparisons and make and provide some intelligent insights into my business that I simply couldn't do with this without this technology before. So I recognize that we're beginning to chew through some time here and I'm going to pick up the pace. But I really wanted to focus in on the AI part. We've talked about extraction. We've talked about automation. There are other things that we can do with AI. Begin to predictively deliver information to the right work performer at the right time. We can analyze usage and importance. So not only can we look at what's in a document and begin to intelligently extract that, we can also look at who interacts with the document when they typically interact with the document. We can begin to understand the importance of information to your organization, and in doing so, begin to more intelligently deliver that to the type of people who need it in your organization. As we showed from a fraud standpoint, we can also recognize patterns and connections. We can identify outlying data points and really begin to use this to more intelligently enable you to interact with information. Now, let me quickly move through some of the other pieces. When we talk about customer experience and we talk about content in organizations, we talk about this 20-year-old enterprise content management challenge. When we looked at content previously, it used to be about electronic documents. It used to be about scanned images, perhaps even managing email in the organization. But as we illustrated as part of that claims process a few moments ago, the range of content that you're being asked to manage in your organization is changing. Now we're dealing with photos. Now we're dealing potentially with video or audio files. Now we're dealing with social media content. So one, we have to manage a more diverse set of information. Two, we have to manage a much larger set of information. And this creates scale challenges for a lot of legacy ECM technologies. It also creates capability challenges challenges in terms of how do we deal with video, how do we deal with audio, how do we deal with some of these new formats. It also creates an explosion of information. We have a customer that we're talking to right now who literally wants to capture SMS messages, email messages that they send out in real time to customers and be able to display those to customer service representatives. In their entire history, they've captured about 10 billion objects in their repository. But if they begin to capture email and SMS messages in real time, we're talking about 250 million new objects a month. We're talking about 3 million billion over the course of a year. So literally in the next three years, they look to double the overall corpus of information that they're managing as part of that customer experience. And that's a great illustration of how content really begins to define the customer experience. We need to think about when, where, and how we get content from users and across what different devices and platforms. And we also need to think about how we deliver it to users. The other thing we need to recognize, and, and this is one of the critical things that we talk to customers about, is that silos in your organizations aren't going away. We can talk about bridging silos, and the old ECM approach used to be stick it all in one place. Not very realistic. The reality of how our customers work today is that they're creating more silos every day, not less. And so what we really need to think about is an intelligent way to bridge across those silos. If you think about how you collaborate with information, how you use tools like Slack or Box or Dropbox in your environment, how you exchange information with email, or even how you create content in different tools like Salesforce in your organization, you recognize that where content lives in your organization is actually increasing, not decreasing. So the right approach here is not to try to move everything into one place, but instead really come up with content service that allows you to plug into these different information sources, bridge across these silos that are a reality of your day-to-day -day operations, but at the same point, then be able to surface up information in a consistent fashion. 
That's about data, but it's also about connectivity. And as I talked about with Pat earlier, it's also about having a comprehensive API set that allows you to deliver this information very intelligently across the organization. So we talked about the role of AI. We've talked a little bit about the importance of content in your organization. I want to leave some time for Tivo, so let me quickly finish these last two points and I will hand off to him. Um, so, uh, let's talk a little bit about cloud. I touched on the scale piece. Um, and this is just a simple illustration of what I just talked about, right? Organizations that over the last 20 years have, have accumulated a lot of content, a lot of information. 10 billion is a very big repository. But as you can see, just looking at how they deal with customer communications, how they deal with SMS and email messages, real customer illustration here, as we look out here, what we're really looking at is an explosion in the information that they have to manage. This is all critical customer information, part of their customer experience, but it literally has them doubling their repository size every two years as we build out. Now we're talking about not just 10 billion, but tens of billions of objects. Clear implication here is that you need to think about cloud technologies in terms of how you manage this information. As I touched on earlier, critical piece for our customers is really choice, right? Really what we're finding with customers that that cloud conversation no longer is a conversation about on-premises versus cloud is really a conversation about do I manage it myself? Do I use Amazon, Google, Microsoft, uh, whatever my particular cloud infrastructure preference is and run it myself? Or do I have the vendor management for me on, on their preferred uh, cloud infrastructure. So critical thing for our customers is they're thinking about modernizing, as they're thinking about how they can leverage some of these new technologies, is to also think about the impact that cloud can have for them from a cost perspective, from a scalability and performance perspective. And what we really believe is that giving customers choice here is critical. We also think about things like hybrid configurations. If you have data uh, privacy or data residency requirements, we need to think about where we store content. And of course, we need to think about how we scale up and operate at scale. I won't spend too much time on architecture. The one thing I always encourage customers to look at here, when you're looking at technologies in this space and you're thinking about modernization, is make sure you're also thinking about how these tools have been built. Very easy to take an existing kind of 20-year-old architecture client server, wrap it up in a Docker instance, and deploy it to the cloud. It doesn't mean that that technology will scale and perform well for you in the cloud, or more importantly, will scale and perform efficiently for you in the cloud. So what you're looking for is technologies that scale out individual services separately, that give you elasticity so you can scale up and scale down depending on peak volumes. You certainly also want to look for technologies that have thought about things like multi-tier archiving, how you take older information and move it to less costly, lower performance storage tiers for more archival purposes. Do they leverless, leverage serverless scalability? Can they do edge caching? If I'm moving a lot of images and videos around, perhaps I want to think differently about how I deliver information in that environment. So cloud is critically important to our customers and how they do cloud is important to our customers. The last piece, and I'll just touch on this and go to Tebow, is all about compliance. Uh, very simply, as I touched on earlier, what we've seen around GDPR, uh, CCPA, is that we now have customers coming to us saying, hey, I need to understand what information I have about my customers, about consumers in my environment, and I also need to be able to delete it. Now, one of the critical challenges that we see here, and one of the things that we've been seeing, particularly across our insurance customers, is that many of them run legacy print stream technologies for customer communications. These are tools like IBM Content Manager On Demand or ASG Mobius, right? So they produce print streams, data streams, and then they have technologies typically based on mainframes that allow them to render these in terms of whether they're EOBs or statements or billings or other forms of customer communication. The problem is these are large concatenated data files 
with critical customer information embedded in them, which means that it is virtually impossible to break out individual customer information and delete it if a customer wants them to. Also, these are mainframe technologies. They're very expensive to operate. They are not cloud friendly. And in many cases, we find that these are the biggest impediments to our customers' cloud initiatives inside these organizations. So they're not compliant, they're expensive, they're outdated technology, they are not cloud friendly. A bunch of things I can tell you about mainframes uh, that you probably already know. Critical thing here though, from a customer communication standpoint, is that we've looked at this silo also. And we'll go back to that original problem of bridging across silos, addressing customer experience, perhaps even being able to deliver this information more effectively in mobile environments. What we really want to do is also give you tools here to address that challenge. So again, same cloud-friendly platform. We have a set of tooling that allows us to extract information from these legacy mainframe environments. You can store native AMP, AFP and, and render in real time, or you can convert these documents on the fly into PDF and store PDF in our environment move all this information into the cloud and therefore be able to address CCPA from a compliance standpoint, very important. Bridge one more information silo inside of your environment. Also begin to unlock these customer communications and be able to access them, leverage them, deliver them in different ways. And I think most importantly, while you're increasing your compliance, increasing access to this critical information in your environment, we can also help you take the cost out. So I've hit on a variety of different topics. Maybe I'll ask you, we already have a question in the queue, and it's, um, I think this is something you could definitely um, address. And it says, how are organizations approaching modernization given the current economic situation? I noticed nobody has mentioned COVID-19 yet, but I'm sure that that's an underlying portion of this question. Um, do you want to take a stab at that while we're trying to get Tebow up? Sure. Sure. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, it, it's, it's been very interesting for us. Um, obviously, an unfortunate situation for our customers and, and, and uh, in general in, in, in the world today. Um, but we have been uh, actually very uh, surprised uh, by the number of organizations that are continuing to move forward from a modernization standpoint in this environment. Uh, and I think that the critical thing that we see there, it's, it's, it's a couple of things. Uh, item number one is that um, many of them have realized that uh, as, as part of this, that, you know, one, well, a lot of insurance organizations aren't really well set up for remote working. Uh, so first phase with our customers was really around how do we enable uh, people to connect and talk with each other and, and perhaps even have uh, a working environment at home, but phase two has really been how do we uh, virtualize the back office and even the front office, right? And how do we begin to deliver information, whether that's to facilitate claims processing or underwriting uh, or new policy issuance, or whether that's to really uh, provide information to customer service workers who are still interacting with customers just from a completely different location. So number one, there's been a lot of demand around that. And then number two, um, the reality is a lot of our customers are also looking very hard at kind of the cost environment right now. And as I touched on earlier and when we talked about customer communications, uh, we're talking to one bank right now that is literally spending $15 million a year in maintaining an old mainframe environment. So there's a compelling cost reduction efficiency reason for them to continue to move forward uh, as well. So what I really encourage customers to do, and obviously they may have bigger priorities right now than modernization, but for some of our okay. customers, what we're finding is that the modernization piece is aligning very much with their organizational priorities. Right. You know, if you think about it, um, oftentimes these things are evolved in a, a consequential way uh, not even intentionally. It could be that modernization efforts were underway before the virus hit, but now doing other things to help improve um, the, the content issues that are um, affecting everyone, now we're finding out, oh, now that we're doing this, we're understanding that this also has an effect on how we're able to communicate. So it's, it's um, unintentional, but it's still happening. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I think all it's really done, 
uh, we talk with a lot of our customers about a digital, um, not just from the standpoint of obviously that's an objective for most insurers to become more and more digital, but it, but I think the circumstances we're under right now has really put a fine emphasis on the fact that all information needs to be digital. It needs to be readily accessible regardless of where you are performing work, regardless of what device you're performing work on. So I think all it's really done is kind of shined a much brighter light on uh, what has been a very uh, traditional challenge, uh, really not just in insurance, in a lot of different industries. Right, right. Well, and however it happens, it's happening. So that's the important thing. Um, it looks like we have Tebow back on the line now, if, if I understand correctly, looking at my screen. And uh, we're hoping, Tebow, you can uh, help us with this um, Nuxio in Action demo. Can yeah. you take it over? Yeah. Yes, I can. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, nice. Yeah, so we have um, actually two demos, quickly, very, very short, very short demos um, to show how uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning can help and speed up the claim process. So the first one will show how AI could detect a fraud. In this example, it's a false claim. And the second one will show how it can help to um, automatically get repair estimates based on photos um, of a domain. So uh, for the first demo, I am we have this old so so we are Acne and its own claim company. Um, and we have this uh, old claim, 18 months old already uh, processed, reimbursed, archived, etc., And it was based on this photo, basically. So uh, damage on the left, etc., etc. So the claim is done and processed. And now what happened is that, in this example, Alan, um, a customer, uh, is a bad person, uh, who wants to submit a false claim by using a very similar photo. So in, in our system, it's very easy to submit a new claim. You just upload from the mobile device. I'm going to share my phone. There it is. Sorry, this is me. Okay. So I think we're short in time. I'm not going to try to connect my phone. Sorry for that. I'm just going to uh, upload the photo. And in the meantime, I'm going to explain what's happening. So this is uploaded from the mobile device and the photo that is sent is actually this one here here so you can see very similar and we see the difference between the two so this has been uploaded from the mobile device and in our system it automatically create the claim etc etc we'll see an example in the in the second demo but what happened too is that as soon as the photo was uploaded, we also detected that the photo is very similar to this old claim, so we created a case. And Josh, who is a case investigator, received a mail notification letting him know that there is a new case to process. So I'd like to insist, we just upload a photo, our system create a new claim, set the metadata, use the GPS location, etc but also the text is similar to another one, so we create a case to investigate. So now Josh can look at the case quickly, so it's a case, the reason of the case, it's a similar claims. He can just check it out, basically saying, okay, in the group of investigators, I'm the one handling it, and he can quickly access the claims, or also check the two images that were found by the system. And if you look at them closely, you will see that Alan tried to be smart. He tried that, he failed, but he tried to be smart by not sending the exact same photo. Basically, what he did is that he, he, he made it bigger, so it's not the same dimensions. Also, he did crop it, so we don't see all the sidewalk, all the, all the road. And then if you look closely, he made it also uh, brighter. So, the system who would compare the two images pixel by pixel would fail. But here, um, 
we, we use AI and machine learning to compare similar images, so to automatically detect that there is a possibility of a false claim, so that Josh can process the claim and either investigate or say, no, it's not a fraud. So here, we investigate the fraud. If we look uh, at the claim itself, and I'd like to, to add that if, uh, if Alan logs in, of course, he doesn't have all this information. For Alan, the claim is being processed normally. So we have a claim under investigation, and if we look at the audit, we also make this automatically part of the history of the document. And again, Alan doesn't see that, of course. Also, with Nuxio, you can create easily relations. So if we open the image of the claim, we also can easily navigate and link between all the images that are similar, all the claims that are similar, all the cases that are similar, that, that are part of the claim. So here, the goal here is not to run the workflow. This would be the, the final workflow. But back to this case, uh, we would process it. <coughs> Sorry. And so, uh, in short, here what you have seen is, is an example of how AI can help detect a fraud uh, with this example of a claim submitted with a photo that is very, very similar to uh, the one already used in another example. Second example is this one, face claim process. Fast claim process, sorry. So here I'm going to show how a modern system using AI and machine learning could help uh, drastically speed up the processing of a claim and get the repair estimate based on photo from our AI system, ask repair shops for their own estimates, process what we receive to send only the one that fits our own estimates. So for this, we use our AI system and a damages database. Sorry. Where we have a lot of photos of damages with the details, with the, the type of the car, with the, where is the bump, etc., etc. And our system could detect what is the usual cost of repair for this kind of damage. So we have an average a minimum, a maximum. Uh, the average is not in the middle of min and max. Min and max are more like extreme values. So what's happening is that this system, intelligent, will be used by applications, will send images, and get in returns the most relevant repair estimate. So I'm back to Jane, and as unfortunately, my, I'm back to uh, Alan, sorry. Alan this time is not a bad person, he's a good one, and he's sending this image here of a car accident. So I'm using my phone to send the image. Okay, it's being sent. And now that the photo is uploaded, uh, what happened behind the scene is, is that it's going extremely fast. Uh, very fast because we are demoing the system where everything would be automatic. Photos sent by Jane are forwarded to our damages database. We receive the estimates and how much the repair should cost. We then send these photos to, um, to repair shops that are 20 miles around Jane's home. In this demo, we assume that these repair shops also use artificial intelligence to automatically process the photos, so automatically get the result. So we receive the estimate almost immediately, and we can choose the one that fits our own estimate. So this means that basically uh, uh, it, it, took, it took way more time to explain what it was doing than to have it done. So if, I, if I'm chained, Jane already received the mail. Sorry, it's not Jane, it's uh, Alan. Uh, receiving a mail, but he can already select the garage. And we have the list of garages that are available to garage. He can see them on Google Maps to make the perfect choice, etc. So when he enters the system, 
he has access to the claim and notice that it has been pre-filled automatically because we extract the metadata, we can have a Google map, etc., etc. What I wanted to show is that it can process the selection of the, of the garage here by choosing the one he wants. In our example, let's say that after looking at Google Maps, which one is the closest, he chose this one. So basically, now the claim follows the normal process, and I'm going to be a claim adjuster, really, to show you exactly what we received in the, in the process. So as I said, as soon as the photo was sent, we forwarded it to our system, get all the estimates, etc., and ask the different repair shop to send us some, some estimates. So we have a folder here and all the estimates that we received. So we can see that we are free while we sent only two to, to Alan. It's because one is, is below the price, so it was sent. The other range is 9.24, this one is uh, 8.79. We also sent this one because it was just a little bit more expensive. We didn't send the welcome garage because it was way too expensive. So the system was smart enough to automatically send the, the, repair, the repair shop to, for Alan to choose based on the amount of the estimate they sent us compared to what we know it should cost. I will add that at the end of the whole process, once the, the, the car is repaired, we know the exact amount, we will send back the image to our damages database uh, artificial intelligence system so it can learn, it can improve, it can adapt. So the same kind of damage on the same kind of car, etc., will now have a more and more accurate uh, value. So this is how the machine learning works. It learns also from what it gets. So these were very uh, short demos. And um, we try to show kind of the the future of claim processing and how it could lead to very fast and, and automated process thanks to using uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, an intelligent content services platform as Nux series. This is the end of the demo. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Thibault. Wow, that was very helpful information. Uh, it's always nice to see it in real time. And